Welcome to the City Club of Portland's Friday Forum, Oregon's premier public affairs forum. I'm Jim Zarin, president of the City Club, and I welcome you all, those of you here at the Governor Hotel, and those of you uh, listening on OPB radio or watching on cable television. We are glad you're here with us for our program today, this Friday the 14th of November. Today's program will feature a three-person panel that will educate us about the diabetes crisis facing this country and its causes, costs, and treatments. But before we begin our program, I have a few announcements. First, in consideration of those sitting next to you and those in our radio and television audience, I ask that everyone that hasn't already done so turn off your cell phones and any other device that will or may make noise. We're pleased to have four Friday Forum corporate sponsors this quarter, without whose generous financial support these time-honored Friday Forum luncheons would not be possible. Our corporate sponsors for this quarter are Comcast, Three Mile Canyon Farms, the law firm of Baron Liebman LLP, and AARP Oregon. We thank them all for their support. Now we look forward to an exciting range of Friday program programs in the uh, future. Next week, on Friday, November 21st, we in Willamette Week will honor some of Portland's young civic leaders with the Skidmore Awards. That's one of our uh, very most engaging Friday uh, programs we have each year, and I really encourage you to attend. Following the presentation of the Skidmore Awards themselves, Speaker Mark Halloway of Social Venture Partners will address how we each can leverage our charitable giving through venture philanthropy. In December, we look forward to two distinguished guest speakers, Congressman Earl Blumenauer on December 5th, and Portland State University's new president, Vim Vivell, on December 12th. Finally, I want to mention a very good week, what a very good week it's been for the City Club's research and advocacy and awareness programs having to do with the club's research study report on initiative and referendum reform. That report, as you may recall, was approved by uh, uh, City Club members here at the Friday Forum in January of last year. Now, on Wednesday of this week, the Board of the Organist uh, Business Association voted to include in its legislative package for the 2009 session of the Oregon Legislature several of the recommendations of the City Club Study Committee report on initiative and referendum report, including, importantly, the report's major recommendation for an indirect initiative that requires the legislature to act on all ballot measures before they go to the voters. So that's included in the Oregon Business Association legislative program for next year. Then the very next morning, yesterday, uh, the chair of the club's initiative and referendum study committee, Arden Schenker, Arden, are you here by any chance? I don't think so. Appeared as the lead guest on OPB Radio's Think Out Loud show addressing initiative and referendum reform. So it's very clear that the club's initiative and referendum report has ignited public debate on initiative and referendum reform in this state and has become the baseline starting point for public discussions about the subject, all of which is at the core of not only the research program and the advocacy and awareness program, but of the club's mission itself. So kudos to Arden Schenker and to all other members of the research study committee and to the advocacy and awareness committee that are working on the INR report, as well as to our staff who have worked and continue to work hard on this important subject. Now to our program for today. <clears throat> In the aftermath of Barack Obama's victory 10 days ago, many are now discussing whether his election signals a true transformational change in this society, or whether, when reality sets in, things will pretty much end up being business as usual. The proof will be in the taste of the pudding, of course, but one of the measures of whether our society did, in fact, turn a corner on November 4th will be the extent to which we actually address and solve some of the huge intractable issues that we have either been ignoring or otherwise failing to resolve. Now one such issue is the diabetes crisis facing Americans and indeed the entire world. Now what diabetes crisis, some of you may say. Our panel surely will set us all straight on that question, but let me give you just three quick facts. First, if you Google the words diabetes crisis, which I did late last night, you'll find that there are 8,870,000 listings. Second, the federal government's Centers for Disease Control in Atlanta has formally termed the increase in diabetes in our country to be, quote, an epidemic, unquote. And third, there is widespread concern in the medical community that another epidemic in our society, society childhood obesity, is laying the groundwork for an explosion of type 2 diabetes when these kids reach their 20s and 30s. 
So to follow up on all this and to home in on the reality of the diabetes crisis, we are fortunate to have with us a panel of great professional and per with panel with great professional and personal expertise regarding the subject, all of whom are affiliated with the Oregon Health and Science University's Harold Schnitzer Diabetes Health Center, a comprehensive adult and pediatric center at OHSU that recently celebrated its first anniversary. Now I'm going to introduce all three of our panelists at once, and after I've introduced them, they will speak in turn for about 10 minutes each from the podium and then they'll take questions as a panel from, from where they're seated now. Our first speaker received his medical degree at the University of Colorado School of Medicine and completed his uh, endocrine, endocrinology specialty training at the Walker Reed Medical Center in Washington, DC. He is deeply involved with the diabetes community here in Oregon. He has served as chair of the State of Oregon's Diabetes Guidelines Committee since 1995 and has co-chaired the Oregon Diabetes Coalition and the Oregon Diabetes Collaborative. He is also a committee member of the American Diabetes Association. He joined the medical staff of OHSU in 1993 and now serves as the director of OHSU, OHSU's Harold Schnitzer Diabetes Health Center that I previously mentioned. Now on the personal side, I always like to get a little something personal here. On the personal side, he tells me that he once gave four consecutive hours of lectures through an interpreter to the China Endocrine Society on a cruise ship going down the Yangtze River in China before it was flooded by the opening of the Three Gorges Dams, after which he could barely walk because for those four hours he was having to balance himself against the turbulence of the river. So please uh, greet our first guest who will speak to us in a minute, Dr. Andrew Amon. Our second speaker is a graduate of Stanford Law School, a lawyer who has practiced at the firm that bears his name, Rosenthal and Green, since 1980. He has participated for over a decade in activities of the American Diabetes Association, serving on multiple committees as well as on the national board of directors of that organization. He is currently a member of the American Diabetes Association's Advocacy Committee. Professionally, he has combined his legal expertise with his knowledge of diabetes his publications include titles such as, quote, Diabetes Legal Advocacy Comes of Age, quote. He also is a recipient of the Wendell Mays Jr. Award for Outstanding Service in the Cause of Diabetes. And on the personal side for him, he tells me that in 1998, he caught and landed a large fish I'd never heard of, a tarpon, in excess of 100 pounds on a 25-pound leader in six feet of water in Belize, in true lawyer fashion, it took him an, over an hour to land this fish, and then he let it go. So, so please welcome our second speaker, Michael Green. Our third speaker is no stranger to Portland Trailblazer basketball fans. While establishing himself as a high school basketball star in San Diego, he was diagnosed with type 1 diabetes as a 16-year-old sophomore after which he immediately began daily insulin injections. After high school, he attended Yale, where he continued to play basketball and earned degrees in political science and economics. After college, he had a 17-year career in the NBA, including two stints totaling six years, I think I've got that right, with the Portland Trailblazers, retiring after the 2002-03 season and remaining in our community as a resident of Lake Oswego. Now, our third speaker maintained his collegiate and professional basketball careers despite his status as a diabetic. In fact, on game days, he tested his blood sugar as often as 13 times a day and kept test kits with the team trainer. But he also established himself as a role model for athletes with diabetes. In 1998, he established the Chris Dudley Foundation to aid diabetic children. In August of each year, his foundation hosts a basketball camp in Vernonia, Oregon, the only basketball camp in the United States for kids with diabetes. Over the years, his foundation also supported the Juvenile Diabetes Research Foundation, the Dornbecker Children's Hospital, the Diabetes Research Institute, and many other national and local organizations. Now, on his personal side, there's kind of three interrelated points. He tells me that while growing up in San Diego, he had wanted to be a surfer, but then he learned that there were no surfers over six feet on the Pro Surfer Tour having something to do with balance. Nonetheless, he did learn how to snow ski on Mount Hood after retiring from the NBA, so something about balance there. And in 2006, he actually climbed Mount Hood, and he now takes the position that at 6 feet 11, he's the tallest person ever to climb Mount Hood, and unless somebody could prove otherwise, we're going to assume he's right. So <laughs> please uh, welcome our third panelist, Chris Dudley. 
So our first speaker now will be uh, Dr. Ahmed, and then he'll be followed by the other two panelists. Good afternoon. <clears throat> it's our pleasure to have this opportunity to uh, address the City Club. Um, first of all, my job is going to be to sort of set the table for these other two gentlemen. So I'm going to go through a few things, starting with really what is diabetes. And it kind of gets pretty, I'm a physician, and we get sort of basic and science and so forth. But So it really turns out that the issues are that glucose, or sugar, is the major uh, energy source for our body. So it's actually a good thing. Uh, what happens is when we eat food, the glucose in the blood begins to go up. But as soon as that happens, we have this really well-regulated system, if we don't have diabetes, that would immediately secrete insulin into the bloodstream. And this would actually move the glucose from the bloodstream into the tissues, where it would serve as immediate energy. And some of it would be stored uh, for later energy needs. If we don't make insulin, however, or if our insulin doesn't work properly, it's in that situation where the glucose builds up in the blood, uh, we get elevated glucose, and that's what's called diabetes. And the damage, of course, largely comes from this elevation of glucose in the, in the tissues. There are two major types of diabetes that people probably have heard about. There's type 1 diabetes, where actually our immune system dysregulates and goes and attacks those cells in the pancreas that produce insulin. Those are called beta cells. It destroys those cells. In many cases, it destroys them very rapidly, and that's most typical of what happens in kids. In a few cases, it, del it does that process more slowly, and then sometimes adults can present with type 1 but actually be confused as type 2 because the prog progression can be somewhat slower. But ultimately, these are all people who lose insulin production who can only live by having insulin injections multiple times a day to simulate as best they can what the body would have done without this. This, about 50% of the cases of this type 1 diabetes occur in children. Uh, it, uh, of course, then they live through their lifetime with this, and uh, it's increasing somewhat in the United States. The other type of diabetes, called type 2, is really the most prevalent one now, about 90 to 95 percent of all cases of diabetes. It really comes from inefficient use of our body of insulin, and therefore we have to use more insulin. Our body, if the beta cell that it can't handle that load, then we begin to have elevated glucose. Virtually the same consequences, just a different system for this, or how this develops. This is called insulin resistance when insulin doesn't work properly, and it's influenced genetically but it's also promoted by inactivity and weight gain, and it's really this uh, that we uh, is the reason that we uh, have the worldwide pandemic of diabetes that's frequently referred to now. There's a third form of diabetes that I think everybody should know about or probably does know about or heard of, and that's gestational diabetes that's relatively common and occurs in women frequently during the second trimester and forward where they get elevated glucose and diabetes basically when they deliver, that goes away. But those are women who now are listed as a very high risk for getting diabetes. 70% of them, at least, will get diabetes in their lifetime. Babies tend to be larger, and those babies tend to have a higher frequency of diabetes as they go through life. <clears throat> so having provided this background, I also want to make sure of several things that you know about diabetes. One is that it's serious. Second is that it's common. And third, that it's costly. And we talk about costs that can be economic costs, but it can also be cost in terms of quality of life. And that should never be forgotten because that's an important part of what this disease is. Another important message that I'd like to uh, give to you all is that diabetes doesn't have to prevent one from living a long, healthy, and happy and productive life. And I think that's part of the message you're going to hear from Chris later. And finally, be assured of one thing, and that is that diabetes affects you every day, every one of you, in one way or another. To focus on that last point, I'll tell you that what I actually proposed for today was a title that was called Living with Diabetes. I think appropriately what happened is somebody called my office and said, gee, that's not a very good title. We're not going to get anybody to come who doesn't have diabetes. I actually, well, it didn't take long to agree that that was probably true, but it really highlighted the whole point of why I chose that, that term. 
Because if I were to ask you to raise your hand of who's living with diabetes, I would get a handful of people, probably half or less of the ones that really have diabetes, and it would miss the whole issue. And that is that every one of you is living with diabetes. So you may not have diabetes, you, but it's pretty likely that either your family, a friend, a workmate, or somebody within your job has diabetes. If you're one of those lucky people who hit the lottery and none of those apply, you're still affected by diabetes because it's in, increasingly affecting your health insurance premiums, your taxes, and the pro productivity of our society. So I can assure you we're all living with diabetes and we need to realize it wherever, wherever we are. I'll digress for just a moment to tell you about the Harold Snitzer Diabetes Health Center, so you've already heard a little bit about that, but the Harold and Arlene Snitzer Care Foundation gave a major issue to OHSU to change the way we did diabetes, <coughs> and uh, we opened a year ago, two days ago. It's the only center in the West Coast that integrates adult and child care, and we have specialty services in the center that are delivered by specialty nurses, by nutritionists, by an exercise physiologist, a social worker, a psychologist, and then a variety of both adult and pediatric physicians uh, that specialize in diabetes. The mission of the center is to provide the optimal care to those with diabetes who have an opportunity to come to our newly remodeled beautiful center, but more importantly, our mission is to affect diabetes throughout the region, improve the health of the region. We want to do this uh, through outreach to communities and to individuals throughout our region and to support and promote those programs by many of the stakeholders that we consider our partners and collaborators. One week ago, we sponsored our first Northwest Diabetes Health Summit, where about 200 people got together here in Portland and were able to hear national and local experts talk about diabetes and its impact on, li on, on their lives and lives of many. And it was not a continuing medical education physician or professional oriented thing. It was for people to discuss issues, try to come up with solutions. We heard Ann Albright, the head of the diabetes branch of the Center for Disease Control, uh, talk about the prevalence and the consequences of diabetes. Fran Kaufman, a world-renowned pediatric diabetes specialist uh, from USC and LA Children's Hospital, uh, talked about how diabetes affects children throughout the world. We had a panel discussion led by Brian Gibbs from the Harvard School of Public Health talking about health disparities as they relate to diabetes. A panel led by Mike Green uh, talked about public policy on diabetes and what many of you may hear about in the next year, House Bill 3486. There was a talk on the psychological impact of diabetes on kids and their families that was uh, given by our psychologist at the center, and a panel summary on some of the ways people live, uh, I'm sorry, some of the ways people are helping kids with diabetes live in school and everyday life, and that was chaired by Chris. I'm going to end the remainder of, the, uh, of this time with uh, information that I really promised you at the beginning. Much of it echoed from that summit. Diabetes now exists in 24 million people in the United States. That's 11% of the adult population aged 20 and over. In 1994, there were two states in the United States who had a 6% prevalence of diabetes. Ten years later, there's 40 states in the United States with a prevalence of over 6%. And if I asked you how many of you have children or grandchildren that were born in the year 2000, it would probably impress you to hear, or maybe depress you to hear, that one in three of those children are destined to get diabetes in their life if we don't change uh, the way that we're going at this point. There's nearly 60 million people in the United States who have prediabetes, and those are people at high risk of continuing on to diabetes. Almost all ethnic minorities are disproportionately affected uh, by diabetes, both in terms of the prevalence of diabetes, but also the complications that it presents. Diabetes costs nearly $174 billion in the United States. That's one in every five healthcare dollars is spent on somebody with diabetes. And it does most of its damage and creates that cost because of its chronic complications, where heart disease is increased two to three fold in, people with di uh, in men with diabetes. So that's the most common cause of death in the United States increased two to three fold, four to six fold in women with diabetes, 
Uh, strokes are increased four to six fold. It's the leading cause of kidney disease, the leading cause of blindness from ages 20 to 70, the leading cause of nerve damage to our lower extremities, and the leading cause of amputations in the United States. It's also associated with a high rate of depression. The international significance of these facts is emphasized by the United Nations proclamation that beginning last year in 2007, November 14th, would be designated as World Diabetes Day. So today is World Diabetes Day. This recognizes the magnitude of the pandemic and its international threat to the quality of li life and the economics of countries. And this is the first time that such a recognition has been given by the uh, United Nations for a non-infectious disease. The good news is that with a concerted effort, uh, we, can, we can delay or we could prevent diabetes that this disease can be managed, uh, managed effectively and chronic complications can be avoided if we give attention to diet and to exercise, controlling cholesterol, controlling blood pressure, controlling glucose, and if we carefully monitor the eyes, the kidneys, and the, and the feet uh, to look for early signs of complications. So now you know about the public health consequences of diabetes. That's largely what I've outlined here. But I'd ask you that when you go back to your families, to your friends, to those you work with, that you also remember the personal burdens that come with diabetes. I think you'll hear more of that from, from Mike and Chris, uh, and I'll let them talk to that to some degree, and I'll end here and give you a chance to uh, hear what they have to say about diabetes and how they've lived with it. Thanks for your attention. Uh, good afternoon, my name's Mike Green, and what Jim did not qualify me, qualify me as is I've had insulin-dependent diabetes for 28 years, and I've been on an insulin pump for 12 years. Now, for those of you who don't know what an insulin pump is, I'm holding it up. It's this little thing that's tethered to my body, and it infuses insulin like an IV drip. And of course, it's the most modern, hopefully helpful technology. But um, what Andy didn't say to you about diabetes is it's permanent. There is no cure for diabetes. There is no cure for diabetes. There is no day off for diabetes. Chris Dudley and I do our routines every day, 24-7 for our lifetime. The reason today is World Diabetes Day, it's the birthday of the man who discovered insulin, Frederick Banting was his name, and he got a Nobel Prize in 1922 for the discovery of insulin. When he discovered insulin, people with diabetes had less than a 10-year life expectancy, and in fact their life expectancy frequently was no more than a year or two. And now, of course, Chris Dudley and I can live a long life, which highlights why it's so expensive. So let me share with you, and I want to bring home in graphic detail the impact of diabetes on our Oregon. This is our home where we live our friends, our families, and um, be thinking about, as you hear some of this, people you know who have diabetes. I call it the Diabetes Misery Index, and I will tell you that I, when I was national chair of the board of the American Diabetes Association in the mid-90s, I spoke in virtually every state in the country. And I had the numbers to do the misery index for every state, and did. And it was a topic of most of my talks. The numbers then and the numbers now are so dramatically different. And I'll highlight a little bit of that for you. But this is not just a growth problem. It's an explosive problem. Just as an overall parameter, in the last decade, Diabetes worldwide has increased from approximately 15 
151 million people to over 230 million people. It's about a 46, 47 percent increase in the last 10 years. The projections of that are astronomically much higher. So this is just not a level graph growth. This is an exponential curve. But let's talk about our home. Let's talk about Oregon and diabetes. Last, presently, in Oregon, there's just over 250,000 people diagnosed with diabetes. The number is actually 262 people. It's about 6.7% of our population. We are significantly higher than the average in the United States. The average in the United States is uh, 5.3, and that 6.7% of Oregonians is a 50% increase, higher than the world average, higher than the world average in the last 10 years. 12, about 13% of those people, about 13% of the VA budget, Veterans Administration budget for Oregon, di diabetes related. About 8% of the Medicare budget, diabetes related. In Little Oregon, every year in Oregon, at least 6,900 people are diagnosed new. 6,900 people, that's 19 people a day If you want to break it down into hours or minutes, it's one every 75 minutes. So that in the time we're sitting here, someone new is going to be diagnosed. And this is every day. And this number is, remember, 50% higher than it was a decade ago. What's the human cost for diabetes? Let's talk about hospitalizations, the most expensive medical procedures we all can have are hospitalizations. 56,000 last year, 153 a day, six every hour. Diabetes hospitalizations. Let's talk about deaths. Now, there are about a quarter of a million deaths in the country from diabetes. Our share of that is just over 3,300 deaths every year from diabetes. Nine a day, every day, nine Oregonians die from diabetes, about one every two and a half hours. Now this statistic is dramatically underreported because diabetes is not listed as a cause of death on death certificates. So it's higher than that. Let's talk about amputations. And what I mean by amputations is a leg off because that's where most of the amputations happen. Last year, 1,100 people lost a leg or two to diabetes, three every day, one every eight hours. So in our work day today, someone's going to lose a leg in Oregon from diabetes. And of course, that's every day. End stage renal disease. That means you're going to die from kidney failure. And it means dialysis and all that goes with that. Last year, 968 Oregonians, about three a day, one every nine hours. So again, in our work day today, someone's going to get diagnosed with renal failure that's going to kill them. Blindness. 785 last year, two a day, one every 12 hours. Blind. Here's the most shocking number of all, and of course this is a number that is so sobering to both Chris and I as people who have had diabetes a long time. The life expectancy of anyone with diabetes is 12.3 years shorter than a normal life expectancy. So even though we all live longer, those of us who have diabetes, the numbers tell us, will live a lot shorter period of time. Let's talk about dollars and cents in Oregon for diabetes. The medical bills last year related to diabetes, 1.5 billion. 
a B word, billion dollars. Daily, over $4 million a day. Hourly, hourly, $175,000. That's a pretty good hourly rate for those of you who are lawyers in the audience. Every hour of every day. And this number has dramatically increased. The indirect costs of diabetes. Now, these are the costs of disability, loss of productivity that have been measured uh, because of the impact of diabetes and the inability of people with diabetes to be a full participant in, in, in society and in work. $670 million a year, $1.8 million a day, $76,000 an hour. The combined numbers for little Oregon, our Oregon, 2.2 billion a year going up, 6 million a day going up, $245,000 an hour going up. That's Oregon, that's the economic impact. Those of us who understand diabetes believe this explosion will break our budgets and break our economic backs if something is not done about it. People with diabetes, their medical health costs each year are four times greater than the average person in Oregon. The numbers are, the average in Oregon is about $3,000. And for diabetes, it's just under $12,000 a year. And all these numbers are going up. None of them are going down. The, the misery index for diabetes in Oregon is, in little Oregon, is dramatic. And of course, there are tremendous disparities in the population with American Indians, blacks, Hispanics, all those percentages are even higher as a percentage of the population than the numbers I've given you. And we don't have huge populations like a lot of states, but even with our fewer minority population, our averages are higher than the national average. Go figure. Don't know why. No one has figured that out. But those are, that's the tail of the tape for Oregon. So. What's to be done about it? Well, part of what's to be done about it is to educate you about it so you understand. Now, let me point out something to you. I'd like everybody in the audience who has diabetes to raise their hand. Okay, now you leave them up, leave them up. It's about 10%. Now, those in the audience who know someone with diabetes, raise your hand. All right. It's virtually 100% of the audience. There are a few exceptions, but virtually everyone. Now, that's our problem. And it doesn't matter where I go to speak or who I'm speaking to, the hand raising is exactly the same. Every state, every city, every town, every club, every group that's spoken to, virtually everyone in the room raises their hand that's why diabetes affects us all. It's not only our money, it's us and the people we care about and love. So for, for Oregon, I view it this way as an Oregonian. We have a tremendous history in Oregon of leading the way in many things, and we can all conjure up a lot of the things that we've led the way in. But let's talk about it a little globally. In the 19th century, Oregon was the fresh start, the end of the rainbow, where everybody wanted to come and be who could get here. That's why we had the Oregon Trail and those people made that journey. That was our reputation in the 19th century. In the 20th century, our reputation was a little different. But probably the most significant thing in the 20th century was our commitment to preserve the environment and our awareness of the environment. It's a beautiful place, Oregon, and there's a lot to be proud of, but that was sort of our label, that we were environmentalists in the, in the preservation workability kind of way. 
And, and that was the focus in one way or another with recycling, et cetera, through most of the 20th century. What is it going to be for the 21st century? What is it going to be? And I submit to you that the prevention of chronic disease problems, like diabetes, is where we ought to be. We have the facilities. We have the resources. We have the personnel. We can do this. It's doable by someone who is not afraid to be innovative, who's not afraid to take on a tough problem. Let me hearken back to something I said a minute ago. If we don't deal with education about diabetes, if we don't deal with obesity, if we don't deal with the diet problems that contribute to the diabetes problem, if we don't deal with the in greater emphasis on exercise, diabetes by itself will break our bank. Now that's not a prediction that I look forward to having fulfilled, but that's the projection of the cost of this disease to our Oregon. And I know we all care about it. That's why you're here. That's why you're listening. Um, the question is we need to do something about it. Now, Chris Dudley, uh, who of course is a, a well-known athlete to all of us, has had a lot of work with kids with diabetes. And I know that's what he's going to emphasize on. And the important thing about what Chris is going to say, and I'd like you to think about this, he's talking about the future. These are the future citizens, the future taxpayers, the future Oregonians. So Chris, it's yours. Well, thank you. Get this up a little higher. Um, it's my pleasure to be here today and uh, to be in the company. As someone with diabetes, I'm uh, so thankful for the work that Dr. Amen, uh, Mike does, and all the people working on diabetes um, throughout the country. Uh, as has as been outlined here, it's a serious, serious, serious disease, and it's a tough one. It's, uh, I've had it since 1981. I was 16 years old, sophomore in high school, and you just don't know why you get it. They, uh, there's some theories out there what causes, uh, and I'm talking about type 1, juvenile diabetes, and that's where your body does not produce any, uh, any insulin whatsoever. They don't know what, what triggers it, that all of a sudden one day I don't have it and the next day I have it. And why do I get it at age 16, good health, playing basketball, sophomore in high school, trying to surf? Um, and why does somebody, uh, and I have a camp for kids with diabetes, ages 10 through 17, here in, here in uh, Vernonia, Oregon, boys and girls with diabetes. And my campers come to me, and some of them got it when they were three months old, nine months old, six years, 12 years. Nobody knows what triggers it. And what I deal with is what I call the here and now, is trying to help these kids deal with the disease that they didn't ask for, they don't want, and all of a sudden it's thrown at them. All of a sudden they've been told, they're confronted with the idea that you're going to have diabetes for the rest of your life. And Mike just went through um, what's associated with that, and it's not a pretty picture. And how do you deal with that at that age? How do you, how do you deal with it when you're, when you're told that there's a great risk that in the long term you, can, you may have an amputation or you... Uh, uh, blindness, or any of the, the, the laundry list of horribles um, that Mike was referring to. Um, not to mention, not even dealing with the long term, the, the short term issues. You have to uh, take a shot um, four times a day. Test your sugar, test your sugar by pricking your finger um, six, eight, ten times a day for the rest of your life, 24-7, every day. You don't get any breaks. And that is incredibly, incredibly hard to deal with, um, especially at those ages, to, to be told that. And so uh, it's kind of a good news, bad news. Uh, and you've heard a lot of the bad news here. And the good news, the good news part is that even with that, as horrible as it is, we teach these kids that even with having diabetes, 
If you control yourself, if you prevent, if you take care of yourself, if you work on your diabetes, that you can be whatever it is you want to be in life, that you don't have to let it stop you. And that's the good news. And that's what our foundation does and what we try to emphasize, is we're going to help you deal with it. And by the way, you can be whatever it is. You can be a professional athlete. You can be a lawyer, a doctor, um, astronaut, professional, whatever. You can, you can achieve it if you take care of diabetes. And that's not an easy provision, but it gives them hope. And so we really try to, that's, that's kind of what I see is, 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 is my goal with the foundation is where, where I want to help and our foundation helps is helping those kids with the here and now. That you've got diabetes and we all hope there's a cure. And they're working very, very hard and I'm, I'm more confident now than I've ever, ever been in my life that we're getting closer and closer to the cure. But I was diagnosed in 1981 and at that time I was told a cure was probably five or ten years away. And that was 27 years ago. So we hope there's a cure, but we can't count on it. And even if there isn't a cure, you can still be very successful. You can be, you can be a great person. You can achieve great things. You can have a family, and here's how you do it. And we have to help those kids and build them up, teach them how to deal with their diabetes, teach them that they can participate in sports, um, teach them that uh, they can do whatever it is they want. And part of our job is to educate those around, around uh, that child as well, their universe. The stories we get of kids who, who should have made the team but are cut and when their coach is, uh, when their coach is asked why were, why were they cut, they, he says because they have diabetes and I know how to deal with it. Why uh, kids who take tests don't do well and they asked after why, why didn't you do well? Well, I was well but I didn't want to tell my teacher because my teacher doesn't know how to deal with it. So our job is to empower those kids and educate those around, uh, around in his, their universe, to really spread the word, to educate. Um, we want to really get out there and help people to realize that even though you have diabetes, you can deal with it, you can treat it, here's what you have to know. And by the way, we have to all get to know it because it's going to consume us if we don't. Um, it's, it's, I've, I've heard some incredible stories over the years dealing with these kids, but it's been, kind of, the, the, the camp's been going on for 14 years, and I've probably been able to talk to thousands of kids, either through the camps or clinics or talking, or when I was playing, meeting kids after the games, and now these kids are getting older, and I'm getting, you kind of get the stories back and hear from them how they're doing, and, and hearing that they're doctors or lawyers, and, and, and just how, how important it is to them and how important it was to them to, to have groups like ours or others, like the ADA, the JDRF, all work and, and support them. And how important it was to them to, at that age, to know that, that there's others that are in the same shoes. A lot of these kids that I'll have at my camp or I'll see may be the only kid in their, their their class or school that has diabetes, or only kid in their school that they, they don't have something in common with the other kid or, or don't know them, or they're only kid in the camp, I mean a town that has diabetes. And all of a sudden they come to our camp and they realize that there's kids who are walking in those same shoes. And they realize that there's a lot of different people going through those same, same op, facing the same obstacles that they face and dealing with the same issues. And you cannot, um, undervalue that or, or not realize the significance of that, at, especially at that age, to know that you're not alone and that there's others there that support you. And so when they come to the camp, not only do they test, but they test out and they can take shots in front of everybody, they can be open about it, they can talk about their diabetes, and we'll have kids come to us and say, you know, that's the only week of the year where I, I, I feel normal. And just how and when they come to camp, how it just empowers them and how they, 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 they get their, their feeling back, their, to use the Austin Powers mojo back. They just get their, their, uh, their, their, their pride, their confidence back and just, just how important that is. And so I guess I would, uh, I was going to talk some, some more about the, the, the complications and the different issues, but I think that's been 
that's been talked about, and I want to leave some time for questions and answers. But I, I guess I just would like to say how important it is that we that we help kids and we help all people with diabetes and just the awareness of it and that there are, the good news is that there are organizations um, such as the one at OHSU, Howard Schnitzer's organization, that are doing great things that we can continue to support and really make an impact. Um, I, would, I would close in, in with, with two things. And, and one, when I, I've been asked to testify in front of Congress twice about diabetes and, and Really, it's a pretty, pretty much an easy sell because when sitting and all, our, all of our representatives and congressmen have been great, by the way. Um, they've, they've all been very supportive over the years. But you go to them and first of all, you say, morally, it's the right thing to do. And that's, that's pretty, that's a real easy sell. And then you say, economically, right now, one third of every Medicare dollar spent is somehow related to diabetes. One third of every Medicare dollar spent is related to diabetes. And by the way, it's projected, and you heard this earlier, that one third of every person born today is gonna to have diabetes. And so it, you don't have to be a math wizard to figure out pretty quickly that we can't afford that. And so either we get on top of this problem now or it's gonna bankrupt us later. And so it's really important that we However we do it, we figure it out, but we'll address this issue and get on it. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew, Michael, and Chris. Uh, the first question for our speakers, as always, is from our Board of Governors host. Our board host today is Ted Kay. Ted Kay is Vice President of Finance at Teledirect International here in Portland. Uh, City Club member since 1990. Ted received his uh, City Club President's Award in 2008. Uh, in addition to serving on the Board of Governors, Ted is the club's treasurer. He's the chair of the Finance Committee. He's the chair of the Development Committee. He's a member of the Strategic Planning Committee and the Governance Task Force. That's how you get to get the President's Award. Ted Kay. Thank you, Jim. <clears throat> Thank you, Jim. Uh, I've heard a lot about what the problem is but I haven't heard a lot about the solutions. Uh, some of it is education, but uh, how do we deal with deferring or, or uh, not having people not contract diabetes? And can you speak specifically about how that affects us here in Portland? Uh, any of you? Okay, I mean, that's a good question. I think. Um, it's clear that when you talk about the public health approach to things, how are we going to really make a difference? How are we going to save money? How are we going to avoid the crisis that seems ahead? It, it, a lot of it aims at type two, although a lot of the issues, by the way, do overflow because our lifestyles even affect the people with type one, that about a third of the people with type one, they're just like other people and they're going to be overweight, they're going to be uh, have some of the same issues. But if you can look at it, type 2 is sort of the prototype for making a difference. There have been several studies, one in Finland, one in the United States, that very clearly showed us that if you do change diet and exercise, that you can reduce the frequency of progression of somebody with prediabetes to diabetes uh, by about 60% in a three-year period. And so that doesn't say you prevent it, but at least you delay it, and maybe you prevent it for some people. Uh, the hard part of that is that in that study, and this was an NIH-sponsored study in the United States, for instance, to do this, they spent a lot of money on that lifestyle intervention. They, it cost much more for that part of it than it did for the part that talked about metformin, because, which was a medical therapy that they had as one of the arms. That wasn't as effective, by the way. The medical therapy was half as effective as the lifestyle changes. So they, but to motivate people to make them change, I think a little bit of going back to it is really understanding this is not, there's not going to be short-term solutions, there's going to be long-term solutions. It's going to be things like bike paths and it's differences in how we start exercising in school and how we start eating in school and in lots of the, what we do in the workplace and how somebody in the work, that, that our supervisors tell us to go out and exercise at lunch or make it be, uh, simple to do that. Lots of those sorts of issues because it takes a long time. I think a good example for you to take home as to why diabetes is a problem. It is a genetically predisposed thing and we can't blame people. It's not, there's no purpose to telling people these are just a bunch of lazy slugs who don't 
uh, who eat too much and who don't exercise. It's they're doing what we do as a whole. And some people are fortunate to avoid it. The mainland China, China population had one of the lowest frequencies of diabetes in the world. They have the fastest rate of growth of diabetes in the world because they were probably a genetically predisposed population with even a little bit of change in their diet and exercise have a 30 to 40 percent per year increase in the frequency of diabetes. So diet and exercise are important, but it's not so simple. Uh, Ted, actually, one of the most innovative programs in the world started here in Portland. Um, the American Diabetes Association now has a program called Safe at School. And this program is designed to give kids with diabetes the support so that they can perform like any other student in school. And that started here in Oregon with a generous underwriting by Harold Snitzer. And when we started the program, this had never been done before where anybody had played an active role in school, but it was so important to Harold that the future Oregonians have every opportunity to be as educated and to get the benefits of extracurricular activities in school as any other student. And that program was dramatically successful here in Portland, first tried in the public school system here in Portland, and it now is in 44 states around the country and is a dramatic impact on not only the quality of education that those kids have, but the confidence those kids have and the integration of a kid's problem with a disease into the biology and the science being taught in the classroom. So a fabulous program started right here at home. Um, I, guess, I guess I would just add to that that uh, national problem, especially for type 2 diabetes and obesity, if you've ever seen the movie Supersize Me, is what's going on in this country as far as what we're eating, our diet. And the first, first step is education, um, to realize what you're putting into your body and how it's going to affect you. But the second part of that, too, is, is going to be figuring out how to make it that someone who's lower income can afford to eat healthy. And by that, I mean if it costs you $3 to go to, big, to McDonald's, I'm just picking on McDonald's, but get a Big Mac and a gallon of Coke and, and a tub of fries, and it costs you $8 to get a turkey sandwich, what are you going to do? And that's part of the problem is that some of the foods that, and it was a fascinating movie uh, and a book called King Corn, talking about the subsidies that were starting during the Great Depression to make sure that nobody, nobody was going to starve in this country and how our foods have become so processed and broken down and so cheap that you have these, yes, no one's starving, but now we're going to the opposite end of the, uh, we're having the opposite problem, and we can't afford from the complications that are coming with it, and we have to figure out how to, uh, how to feed our population. If you didn't hear that, he mentioned the movie King Corn, which is uh, done by a couple of uh, recent graduates, I think, of Yale. Yes one of whom is the son of Barnes Ellis, who's a partner of mine. That's got a Portland connection, too. So uh, they, they have it at Blockbuster, I can tell you that. Uh, this is time for questions from the floor. Uh, questions at Friday Forums are limited to City Club members, so please identify yourself by name and as a City Club member. Uh, you can address the panel as a whole or uh, one of the panelists. And the other thing is make sure that you ask a question. With well, apologies to my predecessor, Don Williams, over here, I lost the traditional City Club question mark, but I've made one up just for today. So if you don't cut yourself off in 30 seconds, you may see this, and then these people, they get very surly. So go ahead, please. Chris Allman, City Club member. Um, as a grassroots activist um, and in my former life, an endocrinologist who trained with uh, Dr. Allman, I'm so pleased to see this at the forefront. Um, my question has to do with how do we reach a cure? How do we get energy independence for diabetes? Um, there's a lot of political um, uh, barriers to uh, uh, embryonic stem cell research, which many of us believe is the means by which we get the cure. And, and I loved hearing both Chris and Mike talk about their personal experiences. What are you doing to, um, and what, where do you stand on this issue of embryonic stem cell research 
for diabetes cure? Well, when I was national chair of the board, of course, stem, that was a decade ago, stem cell research was in its infancy. Um, I, I appreciate there are moral and religious and ethical concerns with that issue. As a representative of about 28 million people in the United States who have diabetes, I can tell you from talking with lots of those people in lots of places that we all believe this is the route to the cure. Those of us who have diabetes believe that the cure will come through stem cell research. And we also believe that it's probably not going to come anyplace else. Nobody's going to pull a, a rabbit out of a hat. Um, how we handle that research is a different question. But those of us affected by the disease know full well that we've been promised a cure forever uh, and it hasn't happened, and the reason it hasn't happened is it's very complicated. This is the best hope for a cure for diabetes. Chris, do you have? No, I, I, I guess I would just say, I, I actually got asked to testify about stem cell um, a couple years ago, and it was uh, asked by Gordon Smith, um, our former senator, uh, who was leading a panel on it to, to, to talk about the moral issues, and, and, and there are some strong moral issues to, to, to discuss. Um, I think we've gotten to a place and there's been some, some breakthroughs that the moral issue is becoming less of an issue because there's different ways of, of, of dealing with the stem cell. Um, and I do, I do think the political environment now is such that those gates will be opened up um, more going forward. But there, I, I personally, as a Christian, it had to really do some soul searching and, and think through it, and I came to the place where I was in favor of it. Um, but I, I fully uh, respect those who, who, who are opposed on, on religious issues, um, religious grounds. But I do think stem cell, the promises that it holds are, are tremendous. And I, I think I'm, I'm thrilled that it's uh, continuing to grow. I do think it's, it's uh, um, the, the promises there are, are, are just going to keep going. I'd like to see it grow even more. Um, I'd like to see the, the Oregon get more involved in the research with stem cells. And I'd, um, I think we have a bright future and, and hopefully Good things will come from it. Good afternoon. I'm Joyce Tamanen, City Club member. Um, I think most of us, when we go to our physician or health care provider, we always think we're getting the highest quality hair care possible. And yet the Commonwealth Fund recently ranked Oregon 36th in the nation in getting quality care. Uh, I understand that there are about 10 different tests a patient needs to get every time they go to see their health care provider. How does a patient know um, how to get the information they need? Where can a, a person with diabetes go to ensure that every visit they get from their health care team is a high quality visit? Um, <clears throat> there's probably several answers to that. I think that, you know, we have to go. Um, the best places to go are if you go to the Department of Human Services website here for Oregon and you look for, and in particular if you can hook up with the Oregon Diabetes Coalition, they, uh, part of that, you will find that there is a card for people with diabetes telling them what they need to know themselves. Because we really feel, we're, as part of our outreach for instance, we've decided it isn't going to be efficient for us to go to doctor's offices and tell them how to take care of diabetes it's much more efficient for us to go to patients and teach them how, what questions to ask, as you suggest. And so I think that's one place, if you go to something called the National Diabetes Education Program, uh, NDEP, I think, dot org or gov, I'm not sure, um, that has such a thing. And diabetes.org is a very simple one, American Diabetes Association, and they have parts on their website. Those are important questions. They are things that all people with diabetes should know. And we do want people to be empowered to lead their quality diabetes care. Hi, uh, I'm Barb Wolf, City Club member. Um, 
My husband was, uh, well, let me first say, you're all looking at education, which of course is a big thing here. And my husband was diagnosed with uh, diabetes recently. As a result of that, we were sent to classes, both of us. And the things that were covered in there were just invaluable. And it occurred to me, if everyone could have those kind of classes available, teaching you that carbs are the big thing, that uh, you have to worry about how you eat at night so that in the morning you're not worried about, or how quickly you have to eat, you know, where the liver is involved. If those things could be offered in another way, like even in school, I wonder if that's a possibility or if anyone's thought about doing that. The, um, that, that's a terrific question because diabetes, unlike many other diseases, is controlled by the patient. Uh, the person who has diabetes is in charge. The, doc, the doctor is a coach and an advisor, but a, not a player in the game. Um, and because of that, education is critical. And it's education not only of the person with diabetes, but spouse, children, friends. The more, the better. Uh, because that provides a safety net and a safe environment for a person with diabetes, no matter where they are. The difficulty of getting diabetes education has been enormous. The American Diabetes Association spent many millions of dollars going to all the states and fighting legislative battles to mandate diabetes education. And the reason we could sell it is because it was clear that if you gave people education about diabetes, it would dramatically reduce insurance rates insur and, and, and medical costs. So we created an economic benefit that we had to sell. It was very difficult to do. And the result today about diabetes education is that it is available. Uh, it's mandated in, in virtually all the states to be required in an insurance policy but they limit the amount you can get. And that's a big problem. And that's a problem that we're continuing to work on as these pieces of legislation begin to sunset. We've been lucky in getting them changed to create a broader education. But um, there's no question that education works. There's no question that education saves money. Um, there's also no question that insurance companies, as a rule, don't want to pay for it. And that's the fight politically. So us in Oregon, we in Oregon, if we care about this, then it's our legislatures that has to hear it and pass the appropriate mandate for it so that it, it, it's available. We, we need to stop there. We've run out of time. Um, as we head to adjourn here, join us next week at the Friday Forum for the Skidmore Awards where you'll hear some of the bright young lights uh, in our civic community. As we close, please join me in expressing our appreciation to our panel, Andrew Aubin, Michael Green, and Chris Dudley. We are adjourned. Thank you.